my question is more specific to my situation. So I don't know if this is the best time to uh, raise it. Absolutely. Go for it. All right. So I'm kind of targeting um, threat intelligence and recognizing that I probably need to spend some time in a stock first. I don't know if that's a year, two years. Um, but I guess just thinking about uh, kind of geographic limitations, um, is it realistic to, to do that while staying kind of in the Greenville area, either with companies that are here um, in the area or working remotely or like does SOC have to be done kind of on premises? Um, and, you know, are there opportunities kind of in the Greenville space and then even beyond that to threat intelligence? I know that's, you know, um, a much less common role and generally kind of larger organizations. Um, so I guess just kind of wondering about kind of the, the geography of, of that path. I've been following those conversations in the career channel, and I understand where you're coming from to give some background to others who may not have followed that. You ask somebody the question, what, what would be a good path into threat intelligence? And somebody did answer working in a SOC first. I do agree with that, maybe 50% agree with that, that SOC seems to be a good entry level into just about anything information security related. But I can't think of too many companies in this area in the upstate that actually run a SOC. And if they do run a SOC, I don't even know what it looks like. Does it look like what you might have seen in movies or TV with a giant control room and, and giant screens and many alerts and people running around with their hair on fire? I I can't answer the question what companies in this area operate a SOC, but I could probably lend an idea of what it might look like in that some organizations in this area are not are not going to be huge companies. And I don't think the upstate is is um how would you politically correctly say they're not um they're not very security oriented. <clears throat> uh, take, for example, Charlotte. Charlotte has a couple of major banks that are located there. It's it's quite a financial center. There's going to be a lot of pull for for security-related work there. Not so much here. So that's, that's kind of what I'm saying about uh, the security field. So in terms of smaller organizations in this area, I think their SOC is going to be a small room with two or three people monitoring the network every now and then, and they're probably going to have other side jobs while they do that role. So in a SOC and incident response or threat management or vulnerability management, risk management in general is probably not going to be their central role. That, that's my assumption on um, what a SOC may look like in this area. I hope that others can answer the question better about getting into a SOC and, and working through that. But I think your path might, might be better suited to be more flexible and not necessarily SOC, but maybe threat intelligence from a researcher perspective and being able to understand attack vectors, understand attackers, understand all the APTs, and understanding all the lingo about who's a kitten, who's a bear, and who's an eagle, and being able to understand those threat actors' typical mindsets, their typical attack patterns and being able to translate that to a company who who cares. In in some cases, that's a very specific type of work to understand threat actors' patterns, where a more general approach may be, you might be uh, vulnerable to ransomware. Here's how an attacker typically targets a, a, a business for ransomware. Then you work with the risk management team on figuring out how to build up defenses accordingly for that. So I would see threat management not working alone, but but constantly um, coordinating and collaborating with other teams. And and a SOC may be one way to get there, but I think there there might be others. The problem is my visibility is is not as great as some others, and I think this is where you may benefit on the the knowledge of the whole in terms of knowledge of a particular individual in this team to to get some ideas on how to pivot into sure makes sense any thoughts here 
Hey, Chad, this is Ben. Um, <clears throat> I really appreciate your question. Um, stuff that I can y'all hear me okay? Or am I still muffled? Oh, you're there. Pretty good. My okay. volume's all the way up. Okay. Um, a lot of the positions I've seen related around threat intelligence have been uh, remote and actually a lot of SOC positions as well. Um, and I think that's kind of a pain point for our location is that you don't really see a lot of that around here. Um, you hear about it, but you don't know where it's at. Um, there's from the threat intelligence piece, there's a, there's a great podcast uh, called Hacker Valley Studio. And it's two guys uh, from Netflix and they kind of dive in uh, how they got to that point. Um, so if you're interested in something like that, I would definitely check that out because um, they literally started uh, from the non-technical side, so, uh, at least one of them did, and now they're doing great things. So um, just a little bit of encouragement to you as well, like, you know, it is obtainable. So, and if there's anything that we can do, we may not know it right now, but we can reach out to people and, and see what we can, you know, pull together and help you out with that. Yeah, good. Yeah, I've heard of that podcast. Haven't checked it out yet, but I will definitely do that. Absolutely. I do recommend it. I am doing a good bit of this today. Uh, Chad, I do want to, I really appreciate your question, especially from the standpoint of where do we go? How do we get into this? If you can think of threat intelligence and where what it's performing, the duties that it's performing, the reason why it's so closely tied with the SOC is because that's where the incident response is happening. And most of the threat intelligence that's being pulled together, and that's really such a, if you think about it, such a broad term, what really is threat intelligence? Um, be, because even though you can have industry definitions for it, the only true intelligence that's going to come out of it is if it benefits the business that you're with. And that's going to be unique for, for every business that you go to. So in the, in the case that I performed today, it's very different than it was three, five, and seven years ago. And my title isn't threat intelligence or, or level one, level two, or whatever. There's just aspects of that role that fit into what I do today. Um, a lot of what threat intelligence is trying to do, it can speak to the external threats that could pose for the organization. So that would be working very closely with the governance risk and compliance group to make sure that business risk is properly calculated and that a dollar value for, let's say, ransomware, the probability of ransomware occurring as it did it, you know, pick, pick a recent occurrence of that. What are the chances of that happening here? wrap some dollar value around it, and then put that forward to leadership to say, are we covered, are we not? Um, incident response, when things do go wrong within the company, threat intelligence helps pull together and work with external parties like the FBI, law enforcement, uh, third party companies that may come in and help you recover and they'll include additional pieces of information that your internal logs will not have. Um, one case that's happened recently, um, we saw events happening, saw the incident happen. We had a, a picture of it, but the third party group that came in to provide some of the incident response, uh, like backfill, if you will, they knew all the other pieces and companies that, that this group was also going after. And that extra enrichment of information made the, made the report, made the internal information far more complete than what we had just by looking at our logs. This is, this is a big topic, Chad. So, I mean, if you're really wanting to go down this, the, the threat intelligence route, I, I think it can be very rewarding, especially if you're a very analytical person. Um, there's some amazing resources out there for it, but but as far as roles go, um, I think I did mention this in Discord. It is really, it is a very young, new career. Um, forget Greenville. Um, I, I think in 
and this is just my two cents, pretty much every job we're gonna be searching for, if we're only looking in the Greenville area, Greenville companies, or in the upstate, uh, yes, we, we, we will find some, but almost every SOC, uh, from an MSP to the big time players, they're hiring remote. It, they, and, and honestly, the reason why for that, for a lot of these, especially at low level SOC positions is, quite frankly, the dollar value to hire people out of different countries is much lower than it is here. So depending upon where you're looking and what you're wanting to do, it's more beneficial to, to throw a water, wider net. Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah, I want to have realistic expectations. Irish, if we as a group have the bandwidth to, to take a request like this from any individual, and I don't want a single chat out, just as a, as a thought process or a thought experiment, is to say this individual is interested into getting in this field and doing this type of work. Where will we begin and could we structure the process in a way that step one, begin here, step two, step 10, step 20, and so on. I, yeah, and I, I think these kind of calls that we have, especially on the third Thursday around careers could really be beneficial that where we just take, a, I mean, because all of us, there's going to be a lot of questions that come up about how do we format resumes? How do I write this on my on my resume? If you're solely focused in going after threat intelligence, then I would say go all in and make sure that your resume, your LinkedIn profile are reflecting that as much as possible. And, and truth be told, I mean, this is something we really haven't publicized let, yet either, but as you're learning stuff, if you want to do an opinion piece on um, the DC-864 blog, write it up and send it to us and we'll get it on there. Okay. I don't know if you know it, there's a um, guard group too that does uh, cyber stuff. So it's volunteer, but you get a lot of experience. I think it's like once a month you have drill in Columbia, I think, but it might be something to look at. But anyway, that might be another avenue. Any thoughts about my part of the presentation and the way that was delivered or anything that I may have glossed over too quickly or should offer some more detail on. Yeah, I found it helpful as someone who's uh, coming from outside of InfoSec, kind of from the just broader IT and moving in and just, uh, yeah, kind of the practical advice related to interviewing and then um, especially the the part about um, you know, just being prepared to kind of adjust your career path, you know, uh, dropping in, um, uh, you know, job title or, um, you know, kind of taking what might look like steps backward in order to um, make progress towards, towards the path that you want. Because, um, yeah, I, I previously worked in IT and had some security stuff, but then kind of got out of that stream over into, you know, business ownership and, and web um, design and online marketing and stuff for the last 11 years. And then now kind of jumping back and recognizing it's, it's not going to be just picking up where I left off, but, you know, it's kind of taking a step backward and then moving my way up. So that, that was good to kind of have that explained. Taking the step backward is a risk because you never know if that's going to pay off. And, and there's so many questions stirring around thinking, did I make the right choice? Uh, did I really create a setback or whatever? You could think about those all day. But um, I think in life, particularly my, my own experience in life, is I regret the things that I didn't do or didn't try more so than the ones that I did. And if, if that holds true with others, then sometimes the, the choice may be easy if you're presented with an opportunity. It doesn't look like a golden opportunity, but it looks good and it might present more opportunities in the future that could be the decision that helps you overcome that gap, so to say. I think, I think another point to that too is we, we suffer from the, uh, we want everything and we want everything right now mentality. And so thinking about your point, Luke, of getting somewhere pivoting, um, that puts a lot of pressure on someone sometimes because it's like, I want to get to that 
dream position immediately and it may take time so we have to scale that kind of mentality back and and understand like it does take time and uh we can land that spot if we just you know focus and put the effort in yeah and throughout a lot of what i go ahead unfortunately i mean there's also the fact that and chad specifically what you're mentioning i i don't think there's anything wrong with looking at it as where you go next and your your business experience is going to be invaluable as you make these pivots and moves but the next company you get into may not be the long-term company it may be the stepping stone to get you just you know the title change or whatever it is to be that next step and path forward uh, on the ro- on the road to where you want to be and where you can thrive and with in the time that you're with those stepping stone companies you're still delivering value you're still all in for their benefit and their good um, but you know you may just be you know just passing through so to speak throughout my time talking tonight i um i realized that i mentioned quite a lot about long term strategic goals businesses think this way and i suppose that it isn't um incorrect for us to think about it this way either that these things aren't going to drop in your lap and happen overnight unless you get really lucky I certainly have not been lucky in terms of things dropping into my lap overnight. But I think if we look back at our own careers, my own specifically, I've gotten lucky not because things have dropped into my lap and suddenly it was a great thing, but it developed into something great over the years. And looking back at my career, I've been working for over 20 years. There was a lot of little steps in there and it's okay for it to, to take a while. I don't think um, anyone expects somebody to, say, have all the skills they need for a a, a viable career in their 20s, because in your 20s, you're still figuring things out. You don't know where life is going to take you, and and there are so many changes and growth opportunities that could occur. Um, That's why it makes it really difficult straight out of college, for example, to, to be able to thrive in InfoSec because there's so much to learn. Um, By the time you're in your 30s and 40s, I think life is a little more stable and you have a better idea of what you like and what you want out of out of work and out of life to be able to make those choices. Um, But I definitely wholeheartedly believe that many career choices and, and career moves are long term. If you're looking at them short term, I don't think the word for that is career. I think you're just looking for a job and there are certain certain valid times in life where you just need a job to get by and to pay some bills and that's perfectly acceptable but if you're thinking about career that's that's when you're thinking long term and i think those are more valid conversations for us to have and that's why the channel is called career rather than jobs because we're thinking long term just for clarification you're saying long term with one organization long term career in general be that in one organization or whatever like so many so many of the threads that i brought up saying when when you hack your career look at job postings and then think of where you can position yourself in six months or a year not where you can mold your your resume today to be able to apply for those jobs tomorrow yeah i gotcha gotcha thank you I, i'm thinking longer term and, and be it in one organization like my specific example, I've been with Verizon for 20 years, and I can say that because Verizon's a huge company and there's so much work to do and so many different areas that of the, the business to, to be able to contribute. And uh, being someone who is a lifer in terms of, of one organization is not good and it's not bad. It's okay if, if that's comfortable for them. And I don't think it's too short-sighted to say that it's one culture because there's so many different people and so many different cultures. I've, I've heard some, some negatives about working in one company that, that asks the question, what can you possibly learn in, in one place? Don't you just exhaust all the knowledge? Well, it depends on where you are and where you go and where you take your skills. That one company, like in my specific example, there's, there's just so much. It's not one culture. It's, it's an overall culture with so many different groups doing their own thing. That um, that you can still pick up a lot. 
that's more of a side rant on the pros and cons of one large company versus a smaller company. And I think you can you can still take the the long term path in smaller companies. Some smaller companies um, move much quicker than others. I can definitely say Verizon moves slowly inside. There's certainly more bureaucracy and just a, a slower moving machine in general. But if you don't like that, smaller companies can certainly um, make it more interesting, maybe less stability, but maybe um, more interest as a side effect. JT, I know you mentioned earlier you're mentally drained, and I appreciate that you can join. That's a perfect yeah. example of how I was also mentally drained, but it turns out that I'm more energized now because I I was able to shift gears and I stopped making it rain hashes in the um, in the job that I'm doing and you know, switch gears and talk about this yeah. instead of um, grinding through the other work that I had going on. Yes. It, yeah. It's kind of refreshing for me, even though I came into this talk about two hours ago, dreading it. I, I thought this was going to be a giant train wreck because I was not mentally in the state where I really wanted to talk about this, but I'm glad I, for one, pushed forward. I'm glad to see you here as well. Absolutely. Thank you. It was, uh, I agree. It's definitely a refresher. And it's always good to talk to our group. It is. I think we have a good energy. I believe we do. No bias, right? I didn't get an opportunity to jump on the DC 706 talk, but um, Ryan was giving that talk about his life in a sock. And that might come full mm -hmm. circle to Chad's question and dilemma whether to enter into, um, into the field through a sock. Maybe Ryan's talk might have some, some insight into that. They said it was being recorded, and they're going to reach out to me when that recording is ready and posted. I think it's yeah, I uh, asked about that earlier today as well, and Melissa said that um, she's planning to post it um, either tomorrow or this weekend, um, and they would post it on LinkedIn, and it would be on the YouTube channel as well. So I am watching for that. Now, Chad, is this, is this under the um, thinking that you have to start off in the SOC? to get to the to where you want to go well i would love to go right into cti but um because i don't have a job title um in influence for the last 11 years um I, I would i was thinking that i would need to have some kind of intermediate role some kind of stepping stone between here and cti um and kind of my research and what others had said, it seemed like SOC was kind of the, the most common way, um, whether you're coming from school or a career changer, um, that that's usually kind of the place to then pivot on elsewhere into InfoSec. So that's where I've been kind of focusing is, okay, what can I do to prepare myself to get into a SOC and then from mm -hmm. there move to CTI? Uh, but I'm, I'm totally open to going straight into CTI or taking some other path to get there. I, I was curious because I, I found myself uh, before I transitioned um, you know, I was a Linux admin for a while and that was the first thought I had was, do I have to do a sock? And then of course, you know, with that, it's like, just like what Luke mentioned earlier, um, taking steps back, well, you know, and, and that's hard, right? Because you're not only taking steps back from a posi positional standpoint, but also financially. And so those things can, get, can be really scary. Um, Thankfully, um, where I'm at currently, I was able to get some support and actually transition over to the security team. So um, I didn't have to do the whole SOC thing. Now, that maybe that would have looked different if I didn't have this opportunity. So I, I asked because I also um, felt the same way when I first try to get in like, yeah that's good to know yeah i have i have seen that yeah sysadmin could be kind of another route and i have some sysadmin experience so that may be a way i i think if you've got it you know uh play towards it yeah 
Chad, just it's it's kind of interesting, right? Because most of the history of InfoSec is layered upon all the other history of IT, and SOC is becoming this hub into all these other roles and positions, the same way supposedly like the CISSP is, or in the, in the previous days it was the Bachelor of Science in Computer Science, and if you can look at CTI and pull say 20, 30 jobs and go through and find all the commonalities that you you can currently confidently speak to today, definitely put those in your in your profile. Definitely shape it that way because there there really is nothing saying you have to go through the SOC. It is the common hub, but quite frankly that's only because it just for lack of a better term, it almost just seems easier to make it that way from a business perspective. But I mean you're not coming into this with a few years of experience. I mean, you know how much you have uh, and, and what your, your capabilities are there. Truthfully, doing the job of CTI, the tasks for it, aren't super complex, but they are a skill and an art, quite frankly. Certainly the more you share of your own words and thoughts, be it on like LinkedIn posts or your own blog or Twitter, definitely show a track record that you know what you're talking about and can help you get through the door easier and quicker. There, there's truly nothing saying you have to go through the SOC. Or if you did, that you'd be at a junior level. I think this conversation is based upon one piece of feedback from one individual. And I'm not discounting that feedback in any way. That, that's perfectly good advice from one person. However, what is limited there is it's only from one person. And I think a, a broader view is really necessary. I can't think of any any role in security that has a very defined path. There's no one path. Think of a tree where where the, the base of the tree is that role and think of all the branches that could possibly come into that one role. There's just so many different ways to to come at this problem. So I wonder if reverse engineering it might be a better way. So for example, instead of looking at job postings about what the role requires, which is certainly one perfectly good way to do it, and that's highly recommended based on what I just talked about over the last hour and a half, but reverse engineer it in a way where you look for the people who are already doing that work and you ask them figuratively, metaphorically, or literally, how did you get into this role? What was valuable and what was not? And for someone interested into getting into that specific role, ask the question, what would you uh, advise someone to do? Where, where to spend the, the, their effort for best bang for the buck? Yeah, yeah, that's great. I, I've been looking at um, job posts and kind of looking at, you know, what are the common, um, you know, requirements in those posts. But uh, yeah, I haven't yet taken the step of um, finding people who are in CTI today and then asking them about their path or what they would advise someone today to do um, to enter the field. Yeah, this is good. Luke, thanks for the presentation. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, doing this each month. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Great talk, guys. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Y'all have a great night. Yeah, you too. See ya. Have a good night.